Follow the White Rabbit is a game that will teach all white rabbits how to play practical politics. Practical politics is what you say every time you open your mouth. You're playing practical politics. It is called practical politics because it is non-voting, which makes it very, very practical. Once you learn practical politics, how to stay on point, how to make your point over and over again, you can learn to play conventional politics, which is what you, what you do at the voting booth, which is very rule-based. Practical politics has zero rules other than uh, staying on point and understanding how a talking point works. Now, once you learn practical politics, you can also gear yourself up for um, full-spectrum pl- practical politics, which is polit- practical politics by any means necessary, engaging an opponent or a system and taking it down by any and all means necessary within the rules and the law, but never breaking the law, never breaking the, the rules. Um, it is a very dynamic game. It's one of the most dynamic games played on Earth right now, and I will talk to you more about that. Well, practical politics is simply the art of making a point and staying on point over and over again. Why do talking points work? Oh, I know what you're saying. Talking points don't work because the masses are asses. Well, no, they work because the masses are asses. Study after study has shown, and billions have been spent to show, that saying the right thing at the right time uh, just works. It's that uh, hit me baby one more time ten years after the fact that you can't get out of your head even though you hate the singer. It's that uh, help me help you from that movie that just raced through your mind. It's that, uh, oh, yes, we can, that your neighbors fell for. That's what talking points do. They are just uh, sound bites geared for the right place at the right time. But um, the type the type of uh, thing we do in practical pouts is the type of thing that uh, Bob Whitaker does is not your typical talking point. It's not there like a slogan to sell a brand. We don't, um, we don't uh, spin BS. Um, BS is a, a, a practical term for uh, for what the, what the other side does. What we do is weave velvet. And what Bob does is weave a particular type of velvet, which is just truth. And when you have a system based on partial lies or based on uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, some kind of closed-mindedness, uh, saying the truth in a funny way over and over again can help. Uh, Bob is very, very good at what he does. Um, we can assume that because he's played at the highest level uh, imaginable, and I'll talk about some things about Bob. I know Bob personally, although I don't know him personally. I've watched him from afar. Um, I watched him in Chicago and uh, and uh, not so much in Boston, but Chicago, especially in the Midwest, when he got involved in uh, Little White Rabbit busing. <laughs> he didn't think Little White Rabbit should be experimented on, or Little Brown Rabbit should be experimented on, some big social engineering program. And so he came out very forcefully from Washington to, tr- to try to help them. And um, although he failed in that endeavor, and he failed in Boston endeavor, he went on to uh, to stonewall someone in the Reagan administration when they tried to force integrate um force integrate the uh, the private schools vis-a-vis the tax code. They were going to use the tax code uh, to take away tax status in, in private schools if they didn't, um, some type of weird, you know, another social engineering scheme. But he, he stopped that personally. But uh, Bob Whitaker was the only one I've ever seen from Washington come out and try to help little white rabbits. And uh, he's one of those big white rabbits. He's what you see is what you get, and that's a term I'll use. What was he wig? Uh, what you see is what you get, and that's exactly what he is. Um... But in Washington, it's something pretty pretty rare, I'm sure you can understand. But uh, I've seen that firsthand from him. Um, I've seen it and watched it from afar and uh, always thought I'd want to work with him on something. And later on, I got to know of him from uh, his time at the, the CIA. And what he did at the CIA, well, we can assume he did practical politics. <laughs> he did practical politics on some level. And I'll talk to you more about his time at the CIA or what I know about, like something funny from his interview that I know and other things like that. But uh, Bob uh, has a particular uh, talent uh, for for making the silver whistle to blow in front of the plane of glass to shatter it. And he makes the t- t- particular type of talent. Uh, he has that type of talent to make the uh, golden horn that can, on the third march around, can bring down the walls of Jericho. You see, you can deal steel against a structure all day long, and dealing steel is, is you know, shooting at something, uh, blowing it up, or, or just uh, unloading with bombs time and time again against a, against a rigid structure, and it can stand there, it can even strengthen it. But the right tone at the right frequency can just shatter it. And that's how harmonics work. You cannot, you cannot protect yourself from words, even though you want to. You cannot 
do anything when the truth hits you. It's like driving by that accident and you don't want to look, but you have to. And that's what Bob specializes in. Me, I'm not what you see is what you get. I'm wide sky. What you don't see can kill you politically. Uh, you'll never meet me. You may, you may not even want to meet Bob. But uh, the only thing you have to know about Bob is that he's very, very good at what he does. He designs talking points and uh, mantras to bring down a closed type of system by pointing out its flaws over and over again in a funny way. And uh, that's simply a talking point. You're issued a talking point and you stay on point. And you're, you're playing Follow the White Rabbit. And again, Follow the White Rabbit is a, is a game that will teach you practical politics. Practical politics is practical politics because there's no voting in it. It's what you do when you open up your mouth. When you open up your mouth, you should make it an exercise in power, not an exercise in stupidity. Um, but that's, that's generally, and Bob is, 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 is a legend at that. Um, and uh, we know, again, that, that, that talking points work, because study after study show that they work. Um, at the right place at the right time, you can, you can become famous on one-liner. Um, but he does a very particular type. Uh, he doesn't spin BS. He, he weaves velvet. He, he puts out the one that, that, pokes, that pokes fun at something again and again and again. And, um, and that's what Bob does. Um, uh, and again, uh, you will never meet Bob, most likely. You definitely will never meet me. Um, but you can get on his blog. You will see different uh, maybe different political groups from around the world, some you know, some you don't know, some that reveal their name, some that don't reveal their name. And they in the future will be posting uh, messages and, and maybe uh, asking for talking points or they could be undercover. Undercover lover is someone that um, you don't know what they're about politically. They're put there for a particular reason. They're what you don't see can kill you politically. And they're looking to blow the big kiss, maybe hang the vote at the right time. I know what you're saying. You're saying that's not nice. Well, uh, practical politics by any means necessary isn't nice. That's the way the game is played now. Um, now I know what you're saying. You're, you're all idealistic. You want to get in and change the tires, but you've got to know who's driving the car, and you've got to hit the brakes and pull the thing over and put it in the park before you do any of that. So we're here to teach you practical politics. And... Uh, Again, you're going to play it whether you like it or not. And also, you play Follow the White Rabbit whether you like it or not. Oh, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Chad, out there in Seattle that uh, you don't play Follow the White Rabbit. Sure you do. Every time you get in your Prius and go to the local environmental meeting, that's exactly what you do. You play Follow the White Rabbit. Right. Yeah. So, what is the first, what, what is the first objective? The first objective is to teach you a talking point, to get you on point and, and saying the things, same thing over and over again. The only key to talking point is repetition and harmonics in, in a particular area. You don't even have to do it. You can say it in your bedroom. Uh, you can give it to the next door, next uh, kid next door to say. You can give it to the old lady. There are no limits to follow the white rabbit. The, it only starts with me a white rabbit, you a white rabbit. It's very simple. And that's one wonderful thing about practical politics that most of you don't understand. It's not idealistic. Um, that goes conventional politics can appear to be idealistic, but most of you are probably getting the, the ideal that uh, voting politics isn't very idealistic at all. But practical politics is not necessarily idealistic at all. Ours is not idealistically at all. Bob will talk to anyone, anywhere, anywhere, and I'll work for anyone as long as it's me a white rabbit, you a white rabbit. It's very simple game. And the first talking point I want to give you is when you're called a racist. The only answer should be, in your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. Anti-racism is just a code word for anti-white. In your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. Anti-racism is just a code word for anti-white. Now, I know what you're saying. That won't work because talking points don't work and masses are asses. No, that's precisely what they do work. Something that points out the truth over and over again at a time like that, time just like this, it works. Why are we having this conversation right now? It's time for us to have this conversation. What is my name? You can call me H. Some call me Horace. Some call me Agent H. Some call me Horace the Avenger, the agent that you don't want at your door. It doesn't really matter what you call me. I'm just that big white jackrabbit next door looking looking out for the other little white rabbits, and I'm here to do a job. And um, my job is the timing. I don't make the whistles. That's Bob, and Bob has a huge ego. His ego is Bugs. And he has a huge ego, and he loves making that golden horn to bring down Jericho. He loves making that silver whistle. Me, I like blowing it. I'm going to be that piece of ice you slipped on last winter. I'm going to be that puddle you stepped in in your new shoes. I'm going to be the character you never forget. And uh, I'm the one that steps up at the end and, and takes the bow that no one sees. But that's my game. That's what I like to do. Again, your objective is just to stay on point. 
When you're called a racist, you say, in your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. In your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. Anti-racism is just a cold word for anti-white. Anti-racism is just a cold word for anti-white. The game is simple. Me a white rabbit, you a white rabbit. In your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. In your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. You just make your point and you move on. Again, you're not arguing. You're just making a point. It's an exercise in power. The more you do it, the better off it gets. Now, I know what some of you are saying. Some of you steely-eyed Lone Ranger, Lone Ranger white, white rabbits are saying, uh, I don't open my, open my mouth. That's very intelligent. It's very intelligent. Being intelligent makes you useful for me. But to be useful for me right now, you have to be flexible. If you were flexible, you would say, well, I'll give that to someone else and see how that works and get the harmonics up in my area. It's designed right now for this time. It seems simple, but it's not. It, over and over again, and there is no... There is, no, uh, there is no limits to what you can do with it. Just give it to someone else to use. You don't have to open up your mouth. On the other hand, if you're driving in your squad car and you say that over the radio, well, that's practical politics. Why? Because you're saying the truth. Now, if you say it over your radio at the right time and you end up getting to, to run the whole state police department, <laughs> that's practical politics by any means necessary. And maybe you maybe you saw some of these elections down in down in Florida there. Uh, that young man from uh, Stormfront, kind of a famous young man, Derek Black, got elected, and uh, he got elected under conventional politics. But then he was denied the right to sit down. Um, uh, that's practical politics by any means necessary. It ain't nice. No, it ain't nice. You want nice? Don't be born in a dark age. And uh, if you want nice, get a dog, rabbit. But uh, white rabbits aren't going to see nice. And you know what? You'll have plenty of white rabbits on your side that won't be nice. But that's the way the game is played. Um, and we don't deal with terms like, uh, we don't deal with uh, steel, so we don't deal with uh, terms like lone wolf. We deal with terms like undercover lover. We don't deal terms with like dealing steel or blowing something up. We deal with terms like blowing kisses because we don't break the law. You don't have to break the law. That's the wonderful thing about practical politics. You can just use the rules against the rules to the fullest extent to achieve whatever objective you have. And our objective right now is just to... Uh, to get on to get on board and to and to keep moving and that'll be uh, another another track I'll, I'll introduce you to the ethos of the white rabbits and that's Godzilla the green goddess and uh, that'll be on the next track this is an intro to the system you're in the system uh, basically in greater anglosphere red hippopotamus sphere or some of you call it judeosphere uh, the system is a second generation communist system uh, first generation communists uh, designed it, so we, we will call it second-generation communists. Uh, Leon Trotsky, that great pink rabbit, he didn't like first-generation communism because it wasn't revolutionary enough. And let me define that for you. Russia is still full of white people. Uh, Vietnam is still full of yellow people. Communist, uh, or communist China is still yellow. They didn't like that. They wanted something more revolutionary. <laughs> and and so they decided they decided to mix up uh, certain elements of first generation communists, uh, whether it be uh, active measures or activity on mer and then the English of the KGB, with uh, with some variety of different pseudo capitalistic type uh, type things. Uh, th so the the social system is second generation communist or scientific racism, not scientific materialism, uh, and the economic system is 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 simply a corporate feudal state or corporate feudalism, uh, a feudal state based on corporate control, large plantations with corporate control, uh, and so we have the we have the thesis uh, second generation communism, scientific racism. We have its antithesis, a uh, corporate feudal state with its which, with a synthesis, uh, that's globalism. Uh, but unless we define it, it all becomes wordism, and our enemies use it against us. They always change their isms, but it's always the same old ism, isn't it? Yes, it doesn't matter what ism they give you, it's the same old ism. Because it's wordism. And that's what they do, this ism and that ism, but it's all the same synthetic BS. And so I'm going to define it for you, and I just did that. Uh, First-generation communists... Scientific materialism had nothing to do with um, with race, really, but it did. Uh, but they didn't go they didn't go out of their way trying to mix and match everything. <laughs> well, Trotsky didn't really like that. Uh, they wanted to end all particularism in a society, and um, and so they started mixing and matching. And that's that's where you got the uh, second uh, the second generation, or what what the conservatives now called um, uh, call social Marxism. Yes, they call social Marxism, but Marx was only interested in economics, so that doesn't make any sense. But you see, 
they like to define themselves. Well, we don't do that because you can't really argue with them because they'll always redefine themselves as another ism. But uh, scientific, uh, scientific racism is simply an, an accompaniment of every single ism you've heard of, multiculturalism, diversity studies, um, this ism, uh, that ism. It all is the same old stuff. But what they did was they took like Chairman Mao's political correctness and they brought it into corporate America and all over Inglesphere. And how they did that was through Tavistock. Tavistock is a famous social engineering school. It's it's a famous school for second-generation commies, um, and what they—that was probably more dangerous than even um, the Frankfurt School. Most conservatives know about the Frankfurt School. They know all about uh, uh, cultural cultural Marxism, but it isn't that. You never let your enemy define themselves. You define them for them because they're always rearranging on you, and that's what they do. That's what they're the masters of. But uh, Tavistock was something that, uh, that Freud ran, and Freud was involved in that. And he was involved in bringing certain ideals from Marxism, from active measures, from uh, uh, psychological warfare, into corporate, uh, corporate America, as well as, as well as the churches and stuff like that, because this stuff permeates everywhere. And they did this after World War II. They also, uh, of course, you have the famous Frankfurt School, which uh, designed a lot of the social engineering programs and everything else. But that is all second-generation communism or scientific racism. Um, and uh, it means uh, it's a, a wide collage of, of every single experiment that they thought would work, from, politi- from Chairman Mao's political correctness and so on and so forth. And the economic program, the reason it's so radical is because of, is because of basically how damaging it is. Again, their idea was to de- it's destroy particularism, destroy anything unique about any tribe anywhere. And they did this through a pseudo-capitalistic system or a, cap- a system that looks like capitalism on a shell simply because it has a stock exchange. What well, is not a free enterprise system? Maybe if you're in some parts of technology or some parts of financial services, there could be some free enterprise there. Yeah, it's a mixed bag, but it's a feudal state based on corporate control. And, um, and that's what they've done, and it went globalism, and everyone knows how damaging it was. Many people talk about it being damaging for uh, white rabbits or for our race, but they have no idea how much damage is done all over the world. Um, every other tribe uh, that that uh, that you will talk to, if you really travel, whether it be in South America or or uh, the North American Indians or even to the, some of the Chinese, many of the Chinese that live outside the city, they don't like it. Uh, is very damaging. It's it's a very ruthless system, and it is uh, it has done a lot of damage. But but it's on its last legs. But that is an introduction to your system. Uh, it's important to define as something if you're going to have any type of hope to uh, to discuss it in a formal way, or to even know where it comes from. Uh, but most conservatives call it sci- uh, you know a social Marxism. It is not. It's second generation communism. Um, and and they, they say that because they have a 401k plan, they like the stock market, and they, they don't see anything economic damaging about that. But uh, a feudal state based on corporate control is extremely damaging because it's a two pronged sword. And they, yes, they also took it in religion. You know, they have the three spears there uh, religion, uh, corporate or, or business, as well as, um, as well as the social engineering and government, uh, society, and, and education. Um, but that that's basically in a nutshell what it is, scientific racism, and it is on his last legs. And uh, that's why most of the neocons, of course, are uh, come from communist t- thinking. They are Trotskyites, and Trotsky is one, one, one of the ones that came up with this stuff or, or started designing it. And it was de- deemed more revolutionary. The neocons, whether it be on the left or the right, will constantly say it's way more revolutionary, and it is. And that's what they're saying. It mixes and matches and destroys particularism. It kills tribes. It it changes everything and and so on and so forth. But that's how they think. Uh, but it is important to understand that. Uh, in our programs, we never go into wordism. Um, and if we if I do hit an ism, I'm going to define it in absolute so you know where it comes from, what it is. Because white rabbit thinking is the antithesis of wordism. Yeah, wordism is a byproduct of the pink rabbits and the red hippopotamus. <laughs> that's chaos. Uh, because it always changes on you. It's always a different ism, but it's always the same old synthetic BS. Yeah, if we're going to deal with BS, it's going to be good organic white rabbit BS. The big tall fish tails that we understand where it comes from. <laughs> None of this stuff. But that's your system in a nutshell. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to a topic that uh, that, that, that is critical for you to understand. It's a process you've been under your whole entire life, but very few of you know it. Uh, it's 
the actual word for it is demoralization or uh, activinia meripernacea in the language of the old KGB or uh, basic active measures, uh, psychological operation, psychological warfare. Uh, it's an ancient technique, actually, a four-step process of taking down a society, and uh, it was basically institutionalized and made into like a, a, a science in the Soviet Union when, when the Soviet Union got going and started spreading communism. And it's a great, great brainwashing technique, and it happens in four stages. Um, but the first is most critical. It's demoralization or active measures. Uh, again, uh, activinia meripernacea is, is how it's actually pronounced. And they still use that word, though that phrase, in, in, the K, in the FSB, the modern KGB. Um, it was estimated that about 85% of the KGB was not uh, based on James Bond-type stuff. Uh, they weren't running around the world spying on people. No, they were engaged in active measures. It's estimated that our CIA and many of our different... Uh, uh, different organizations that uh, will, will remain nameless, <laughs> alphabet agencies, are similar in that regard. Most of you maybe are getting, are getting to understand that. Um, uh, but that's one of the reasons that Bob Whitaker was hired by the CIA. He was hired to do talking points in a close society that was coming down, um, that type of thing. But th that is all active measures of various different types. But the first, the first step is demoralization. It's a great brainwashing technique. And the, the principle is to change reality uh, to such an extent that despite of an abundance of true information, no one can come to sensible conclusions to come to the defense of themselves, uh, their family, their loved ones, their nations, their race, etc. Uh, and it, it, again, it is a, a dramatic brainwashing technique. And it takes 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation or a group. Because that's how long it takes to educate your enemy in the ideological, uh, in the ideology that you want to educate them in. It takes that long to get the textbooks out and to get one generation under those textbooks. Uh, you get the you get the ideal, but it takes 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation or an organization. Uh, and there's many different ways you can look at that. Uh, the second step is destabilization. It takes two to five years to destabilize a country. There are three po components of destabilization when it comes to a country. Economy, foreign relations, and defense. Uh, the third step, and is most critical, is crisis. It only takes six months to bring a country or nation into crisis. And then once a country's into crisis, uh, you go into normalization. Normalization is, is a cynical a Soviet expression uh, that comes from when Brezhnev uh, took over Czechoslovakia. He said, brotherly, Czechoslovakia is now under normalization or now going through the process of normalization. You get it. It's a cynical expression, and it can last indefinitely. But that is a, a critical process for you to understand, and the most critical is demoralization. Uh, again, 15 to 20 years to demoralize, to brainwash a nation. Uh, and, this is, and this is what you've been going through your whole entire life. This process was overdone in the United States. It was overdone in the late 80s. Yes, the crash of 87 was, was probably one of the last clear shots your enemy had to take down this country uh, and, fee, you know, and totally get everything it wanted at, at the same time. Uh, in the late 60s, your enemy was at its strongest point when it controlled elements of the Soviet Union, elements of America, and it's, it's uh, the center of the earth, which is, which is Israel. Um, as well as, when I say America, I'm talking about greater Anglosphere, too, because London's a big part of that. Um, but that is demoralization. Uh, and, and this process is well, well overdone in America. It was overdone in the late 80s. Um, by 1998, uh, something critical had occurred. Uh, you, had the, you had the Asian collapse, and there was another opportunity, but they didn't have Russia anymore. They had lost the Soviet Union. Uh, Mr. Putin was in power. In 1995, you had another process that came up. A process that was very dynamic. I use 1995. That's kind of when AOL started accelerating. But in reality, the the BBS boards, the old bulletin boards, most of you old white nationalists, the old timers, um, the the old uh, racialists, they call themselves. You know, the the Resist.com type guys, the revolutionaries. Those BBSs were around long before even AOL and stuff like that. Uh, we own the net. We own everything online. But that process, a new process of communication, totally halts demoralization. Demoralization comes to a complete halt any time a new technology is introduced. It starts to neutralize it. What's the joke? What's black and white and totally over? Newspapers. The Internet did that. It totally neutralized our enemy, whether they liked it or not. And we have owned the net. 
organizations like Stormfront, VDARE, uh, even the mundane ones like Amarin, uh, the hardcore uh, revolutionary ones that talk about real dealing steel or blowing things up, uh, they get unreal hits. If they were uh, any type of established uh, org- organization that uh, that the government would support in any way, shape, manner, or form outwardly, they would they would probably be sponsored by groups like Coca Cola. Why? Because they get that many hits. Stormfront could easily easily make millions and millions of dollars a month off its web traffic if people would have uh, the, the guts to advertise on them, but that isn't happening yet, obviously, for certain reasons. But you get the ideal. The British National Party, which is, uh, you can look at them either way, but I'm just talking about the web traffic, is outrageous. It's the highest web traffic of any political party in the United States. Uh, different organizations in Germany have unreal, unreal web traffic, um, even though they don't say anything too dicey because it's against the law there. Uh, but you get the ideal. Uh, time and time again, if you just look at Stormfront and the web traffic, it is outrageous. But how long has the Internet been out? Well, the Internet's you're roughly around at 14, 13, 15, depending on how you look at it, let's just say even 15 years, somewhere in that area. We're coming into D-Day. Uh, newspapers are totally over. Everything's been neutralized. Uh, Stormfront is in the top so many thousands of websites, and it stays there. Uh, many of you are seeing blogs like, um, even like Hal Turner. Hal Turner, Mr. Turner's blog. He's putting out information from the uh, from a variety of different sources on the economy. And it's very well read. It's quoted in financial newspapers. Whether they like it or not, they have to quote it because it has that type of hits. But that's the type of things you're seeing. Uh, but it's very critical to understand how important this has played in neutralizing uh, the process of demoralization. It went into overdone in the late 80s and then got put into a complete halt, and they haven't really known what to do since then. They've been treading water trying to get their deal done. And, but, but that is very important for you to understand. And there's many different ways to look at this four-step process. For instance, the Republican Party. The neocons took down the Republican Party using this very same technique on a micro scale. They targeted the Republican Party. They targeted the Republican Party because they were losing the Democrats. Your enemy uh, doesn't have the type of control you think it has. They've been losing it since the late 60s. Yes, yes. They've been losing it in a lot of ways. Anytime your enemy becomes visual, uh, they start losing things. It is it is by nature. If if you're a creature of the dark and you be and you're you're exposed to the light, you're in trouble. There's an old saying: fortunes like mushrooms grow best in the dark. That's an old Rothschild saying. If people know how much money you have, you're probably going to be in trouble in a certain uh, economic environment. There's always a certain economic environment around the corner. But the, the neocons targeted the Republican Party. They demoralized it. They took over the publications, didn't they? Over a 15 to 20 year period, they did all this. They started doing it in the late 60s. They started doing the 70s. By Ronald Reagan, they, they were, had their foot in the door. It's a slow, gradual process. Then they went into stabilization. They knocked out a few leaders. Uh, they, they targeted a few leaders as racist or anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic so on and so forth, etc. Then they brought crisis to certain organizations, and then they took them over. And right, and they've been in a process of normalization since probably the, the, the early 90s, sometime uh, after the Bush administration, the first Bush administration during Clinton's. Uh, they started consolidating, getting ready for uh, what was to come. But that, and it's very dynamic. You can look at it in a variety of different where, areas. You can do this to organizations on a mini scale. It's done all the time. Uh, it's done to corporations, so on, so forth, etc. But it is a very necessary uh, thing for you to understand because you've been under it. In the Eastern Bloc, when the Eastern Bloc was coming apart, the Soros Foundation, George Soros, uh, George Soros was using uh, copying machines. Copying machines were a new technology. He was buying copying machines and putting them in there, and his organization was allowing uh, different people to submit different ideals, to photocopy ideals, and, and to transfer them around. Kind of like a micro uh, internet. It worked very well. It helped him gain power there. He's not our friend. We don't like him. I'm sure you know that. Uh, we have some differences with Mr. Soros. I'm just giving you an idea of how dynamic this understanding this uh, can be. Um, there's also another another process uh, ongoing, and mentioning Mr. Soros, right now in the United States and in greater Anglosphere, Anglo banking is in a crisis. Uh, Anglo banking was knocked into a crisis by the collapse of Le- Lehman Brothers. Uh, we know this <laughs> because it's obvious. 
J.P. Morgan Chase took under Bear Stearns. Yes, it was a take under. A take under from J.P. Morgan for a dollar. Yeah, they crushed Bear Stearns and took him under for a dollar, and it was shell shock. Uh, the next shell shock happened at Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers was allowed to go under by someone at the Treasury. Uh, never has a bank of that size been allowed to go under in the history of the world. It doesn't make press, but yet it does. Every single interview Mr. Soros has given since then, he talks over and over again about the systematic collapse of Anglo banking started with Lehman Brothers, and that was sh they shouldn't have allowed that to happen. He says it like he's shell-shocked. Shell shock what happens is what happens when someone goes into crisis and they don't realize they've been put into crisis. Uh, a lot of times they don't realize it right away. It takes a little bit to sink in. But every single interview, if you look up, Mr. Soros has given since the collapse of Lehman Brothers, he said it over and over again. Well, someone's telling you something. You're in crisis. Yes, a crisis. Mr. Soros is in a crisis with the rest of Anglo banking. Uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about proactive measures. Proactive measures are something that uh, happened to the Muslims. Yes, proactive measures are something that um, that is basically not demoralizing, but moralizing. Yeah, they got Mein Kampf, <laughs> and it was very moralizing for them because it went hand to hand with their Quran and everything else. I had a very interesting experience when I was very young. Um, I rode a bus that was uh, to school that was, uh, it was not necessarily 90% minority, but it was. It was 90% uh, majority. It was a, like a UN bus. It wasn't 90% uh, black, 10% white. It was very, very mixed, kind of like this planet is right now. You think you're a minority, but everyone is a minority on this planet. There are no clear majorities on this planet. You only think there are. Um, Africans are the clear majority, but they don't have any power. Um, sorry, they don't. If you have 50 countries in the world, half the world's natural resources, the greatest population the world has ever seen, the greatest piece of farmland the world has ever known, and you don't have any power, or I have to give you powers because you don't have any power. And that is natural law. Oh, you can give insects the right to vote. Yes, if you extend uh, the vote to every living creature on this planet, insects would soon vote, and they'd soon vote themselves into office, but they'd never rule. Why? That's natural law. But anyways, we know that because we know uh, genes are real and it matters. Genotype is real and it matters. Race is real and it matters. We know that, right? Well, most of you say one thing and, and you really mean another because you're already in something called consensus thinking. I'm going to go into that in a minute, but I'm going to come back to proactive measures and the Muslims. So on this bus, I was uh, very, very young, not even 10 years old. I got asked by a group of Muslims if I was an Aryan very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I didn't know what to say because I was just a little white kid. And they said, uh, have you ever read Mein Kampf? Are you an Aryan? You must be an Aryan, yada, yada, yada. You know, maybe I have light eyes, whatever. You get the message. It was a pretty wild conversation. But that should tell you something about how far gone they are. Now, what would it take for you to demoralize the Muslims? What would it take for the neocons to be able to change Islam? Well, we know that it takes 15 to 20 years. You've got to control all the information. Is that possible? No. No, they would have to control every single madrasa on earth for 15 to 20 years. But, because they've been moralized, they've been moralized against an enemy that's sitting uh, right in front of them, killing them every day, it's impossible to solve until you solve that first. So, you got a problem there. If your enemy tries to demoralize someone like the Muslims who have been moralized or been under proactive measures, well, you got a big stumbling block. They can't see that, or they couldn't see that till just recently. Uh, but that's something I saw a very, very long time ago, I accidentally. Didn't realize what I was looking at till years later. But that's a great example of proactive, proactive measures. Uh, there is no changing Islam until you solve Israel, and until you put them under active measures and control the madrasas. I suggest you look up how many madrasas there are. And I suggest you think about what I told you. Um, you can't you can't do anything about a situation like that. Well, you can kill them all. Sure, you could, but uh, they don't really have that power. Um, if if you look at the other side of the equation, their biggest stumbling block, I guess, over the past thirty years, has not been what you think it is. Uh, many people think Israel's their greatest strength. Well, no, no, uh, Israel is a is a big problem. Israel has been a problem for a long, long time, and even even uh, individuals like Rockefeller, uh, famous individuals in Anglosphere, have, have scratched their head over it. Uh, that's the thing they worry about. That's the thing that's out of their control. Well, that's fascinating for you to know that. 
And this type of information I'm giving you is useful for a variety of different reasons. The Russians, when Vladimir Putin took over, a lot of rabbits have their ears scratching their ears. White rabbits don't know what's going on there. I'll go into that in another in another session. Uh, some different opinions, anecdotes, whatever, in a roundabout way. Uh, Mr. Putin is brilliant, uh, but he he is basically a front man to a big uh, olam. What's an olam? An olam is an oligarchy. Yes, that's where the word comes from. The word oligarchy comes from olam. Olam was the was the Druid council that controlled everything in the ancient world. Yes, your life was controlled by Druids a long, long time ago, and they had an olam. And olam is where we get the word oligarchy. One tribe, one olam, one rai. One tribe, one oligarchy, one king. Very simple combination. It works for us. It's worked for us for thousands of years. It continues to work for us for good or bad or ill. But he is a front man, a very powerful one, the most powerful white rabbit in the planet. Why? Because he can put stuff together uh, on a dime, and no one, everyone on the planet has to adjust to it. He has a single vision of the past and a single vision of the future, and his, his vision of the past is going to be a lot different than yours. And his vision of the future is going to be a lot different than yours, but they're very, very smart. But one thing they've shown is that you can put together proactive measures very quickly and put a white rabbit tribe on, on point very, very quickly, even under the gun. But I'll go into that. But those are examples of proactive measures. Maybe you've been over there. They, well, they weren't demoralized uh, through, through racial politics or anything like that. Uh, they, there was no second-generation communism there. They were under first-generation communism. That means that they were still healthy racially. But they were very unhealthy when it came to economics, and someone took advantage of that. The neocons took advantage of that. Uh, they met their fate very quickly um, when it was time for them to meet their fate. But Mr. Putin was there, and he came together under a wide sky scenario. What you don't see can kill you politically. He came to power like our side I always comes to power. Uh, voting, sometimes it's voting, sometimes it's a partial vote, sometimes it's a hung vote. Our side has never once come to power under conventional politics. Our side comes to power or is already in power, and it's too late for them to do anything about it. But by the way, er every group that comes to power now on this planet generally comes to power through full spectrum practical politics there's not really any voting that's happened before it's a partial vote or something agreed on ahead of time you're going to have to get used to that you're an idealist you want democracy to work well i'm here to inform you uh use your noodle but anyways Mr. Putin's a very tough customer, and the people around him are very, very intelligent, very, very impressive. Uh, you won't get a good read on them because they do their job. They don't give anyone a clear target because they do their job. Uh, but uh, that's that, Now I'm going to go into that a little bit more. But uh, something else I want to make sure you understand is consensus thinking. Consensus thinking happens to every group of rabbits and always has in the history of the world. Consensus thinking happens when a group of rabbits get together. They form a group indirectly, directly. Consensus thinking happens, uh, uh, you know, it's like the masses are asses. The masses are asses because consensus thinking is always going on. Many of you uh, white nationalist rabbits, you've been around a while. These groups have been in existence. You're already in consensus thought. Some of you are in uh, the next stage consensus trance. Uh, that is the antithesis of creative thinking. Creative thinking is not a consensus trance. For instance, many of you make the statement that race is real and, and race matters, and you're right. But then you go giving statistics from the same groups that say uh, there's no such thing as genotype and everything like that. Well, there's a contradiction there. Either their statistics are way wrong, way right, or, uh, or they're lying to you. Uh, if someone's lying to you from the beginning, they're probably continuing to lie about you lie about it. A lot of times those statistics are worse or better, but it's never that bad because they know something you don't know and something I know. You can get on a plane and go to another country right away and, and white rabbits can consolidate no time flat. Yeah, that's what they worry about. They're not worried about what you think they're worried about. Uh, but but if you're in a consensus trance, uh, all, all hope is lost is the ultimate consensus trance. You're not going to see things clearly. Another great example of this that maybe even uh, people that deal a lot of steel get into a consensus trance. A lot of them come to something, someone like me, different associates, and they want another perspective on something because uh, that's what I'm good at. I'm good at giving another perspective. I grew up in an environment where you had to be very, very creative. If you're going to get shot at on the way to or home from school, you're going to have to be very creative to survive if you're white. But then again, you have to be creative to survive if you're any color, believe it or not, in some environments uh, right now on this planet. But uh, consensus trance and consistent thinking is the opposite of creative. 
And, and But basically, uh, let me give you another example of this. Right now in, in Mexico, the last three officials that went to Mexico uh, visited the war memorial. They, three officials, uh, basic white men from America, uh, went down to Mexico and they visited the war memorial and they saluted the fallen American soldiers in the in Mexican-American war. It, 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 Mexican-American war. Very interesting scenario. Most people didn't pick it up. Mexicans, some Mexicans picked it up and are terrified of that. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything good for us. I'm just giving you a scenario. If you're in a consensus trance, you're not seeing that stuff. Uh, you should see everything, uh, or at least try to. But that's what I'm here. I'm here to help you understand what the terms are. Once you know what it is, you can recognize it. We all go into consensus thinking. Uh, people that deal a lot of steel. Deal a lot of steel is uh, maybe you read about bombs. Maybe, you, uh, maybe you're a sniper in the military. Uh, you can go into consensus thinking, consensus trance very easily because killing is very one-dimensional. Um, what we do, do uh, weaving velvet and other things like that are very, very creative by nature. So you're not going to be good at it unless you're a very uh, creative, out-of-the-box thinker. Uh, if you're looking to kill someone, that's very straightforward. We don't, we weave velvet. So even if, even if someone's dying, they're getting hung in a tribunal. And, and, you know, there are two ways to skin a cat, or there are two ways to kill a cat. One, you can skin it and get all bloody, which is fine. I mean, he's dead. Or you can hang him. Uh, but sometimes the laws say you got to hang him. Right now, the game is weaving velvet. If you want to you wanna get a rabbit or you want to get a cat, you're going to have to hang him. If you deal steel or you poison, poison him or something like that, well, you could be set up by someone else. Uh, and that's a big game now. You know, set up, uh, set up the Russians, make it look like it poisoned someone. Well... It's hard to prove because they most likely didn't do it. Uh, when the Russians do something, they don't get caught. They're that good. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that, just, that just goes to show you the game. I know what you're saying. You don't like the game and everything else. Well, uh, practical politics, full spectrum, practical politics um, uh, are the antithesis of conventional politics, although they can encompass that. Yes, if you don't understand practical politics or how to use a talking point, you can't do anything with conventional politics. And you can never, ever uh, do anything at all with full-spectrum practical politics. But that's the game that's going. That's the game that's going on right now. I'm here to introduce you to that game simply because a lot of you are in consensus-type thinking. Uh, you, you're, you're developing a consensus from reading Amrin or reading too many. Ob- There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with staying up to date. But even if you're hardcore and, and in the military and you, you can build bombs, that doesn't may, mean that you can't fall into uh, consensus-type thinking or consensus trance. Because any time you go through basic training, any time you go through a boot camp, maybe you're a lone wolf, undercover lover looking to blow kisses. Who knows what you got buried in that that park behind your house? I don't know. I don't care. But you can still easily fall into a consensus trance because you're only thinking one dimension. Dealing steel is like that. Thinking of, uh, you know, maybe you're a police officer and you think of uh, grabbing that M14 and dealing steel like it's cornmeal, uh, you know, and you're an undercover lover, call yourself one of these steel AI lone wolfers. Well, you're easily in a consensus trance. There's many dimensions to this game, and the game right now is not dealing steel. If you do that, you're going to go to jail for a long time, and you're not going to be that useful. Now, next week, that game could be up. Next week, your number could be up. Next week, it may be playing basketball. But right now, it's playing baseball. Right now, it's a different game. It's, it's weaving velvet. They don't do that anymore. We don't do that. It's not to say it's not useful. It's not to say that it's not useful that you know about that. Knowing military tactics and whatever. But they're very one-dimensional. For instance, maybe you were in the military and they told you if an incoming mortar is coming, you run out on angles. That type of thing. Those are hard and fast rules, and they work. They work very well. Keep that in mind. But you see... The type of weapons we use cannot be protected against. You can you can run out on angles and survive a mortar, but you cannot survive that sound of it coming in. That sound is horrifying. Believe me, uh, sound is like that. Most of you have underestimated sound. Sound is something that our enemy fears the most. They say words can hurt, uh, and they're right. You don't know how right they are. But that's what we're here to do. We're here to put you on consistent talking points right now. We are 15 years at, into uh, neutralization of demoralization. You're not demoralized anymore. There's a whole generation that is actually fanaticized. There was a study done, uh, and every, every single, uh, uh, I'll tell you about one I saw firsthand. There was about 30-some young people, all white. And, and it was asked how many of them have been discriminated against for being white. This was in North America, somewhere in North America. All of them raised their hand but one. Then I then they were asked how many of them were discriminated against by white people <laughs> in an authority position. About 90% of them. That's funny. That's a common sense of oppression. That is very rare. 
Uh, that is wild stuff. Many of you old timers are scratching your head looking at these youngsters. They are very, very radicalized. Uh, much more than anything the world has seen. There's other organizations, even in places like China, that are scared to death of what has been created indirectly by some of this stuff. It's nature. Uh, we're not looking to for any particular scenario. We want everybody to get what we want, but we want our own white rabbit hole. We already know that score. But there's a lot. There's a totally different game going on than you think is going on. Most of you are looking for one dimension. You're looking to deal steel uh, because you're in a consensus trance. That's not useful. For you to be useful right now, you have to be available right now. You have to be a little more creative. That doesn't mean your number won't come up. But uh, let me explain something to you. There's nothing you can't do under the laws of warfare that I can't do under the laws of velvet. In fact, velvet is more humiliating because there is no way to protect yourself from sound. You can, you can put on a bulletproof vest and protect yourself from a bullet. You can't protect yourself from the right words spoken. No, you can't. It's that hit me, baby, one more time that Britney Spears gave you that just ripped through your mind. It's that uh, uh, help me help you from that Tom Cruise movie. It's that, oh, yes, we can. Now, I know what you're saying, that if you hit a talking point, someone may snag you up or whatever. Well, that can happen. When, when Obama first it, they issued his good talking points of, oh, yes, we can, it was very effectively timed. Um, you can shut down the first couple groups that do it, but because there's nothing illegal going on, there's nothing you can do once it takes traction. It can become kind of funny. But the game we play is a little bit more dynamic. It's, it's weaving velvet, but the first thing you need to understand is a talking point and how to stay on point. But consensus thinking and consensus trance is something I want you, want you to be aware of on a mental level. Um, I'm not looking for to talk to anything, any, any type of specific person. I don't care. I play a simple game. Me a white rabbit, you a white rabbit. I'm not looking for any specific scenarios. Uh, we're here to achieve an objective. An objective. The first objective is to let you know how to become visible if you need to become visible. Uh, someone becomes visible if they hit a talking point, they stay on talking point. But it's a little bit more dynamic than that. Yes, it is. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more. But, uh, but consensus thinking is something that I've always strived to break out of, and I was successful enough to do that to get noticed by somebody. But consensus trance is something that I never try to put myself in, and it's very easy if you just deal steal. It's something uh, I see all the time. Uh, if you have someone that just knows how to kill people, well, that's a consensus trance. It's useful for a military, but it's not useful for if everyone's weaving velvet. You, you won't be any good at doing what we do if you're, if you're a one dimensional thinker. Just, you know, sit out, your game will be up. And no one's by any means saying you should say something. You should know what to say, when to say it. That's what talking points do. Uh, that's all it is. It's that simple. But consensus trance and consensus think is something I'm going to come back to. Uh, for instance, I did a study. We looked at the internet. We looked at the type of aliens people were seeing. That's something you never thought of. Uh, there's, there's two types of common aliens people see. Well, actually, there's three types. Uh, two types are extraterrestrial. One I've seen all the time. Uh, two types, one's a green lizard. Well, I've seen that on a Geico commercial, a talking green lizard, some kind of some kind of green lizard. Another is a little slitty-eyed gray alien. We see those on the Discovery Channel. I've never seen one in person, not to say they now don't exist. I don't know. There's another type of alien that was very common all over the globe. Now, this is in every language. When I say the research was done, it wasn't done in just English. It was done in every language. Another type of alien has become very, very common over the past 50 years. Well, that alien is, is shockingly uh, familiar to something I've seen when I look in the mirror. Yeah. Yes, he's white. <laughs> very strange. Very strange extraterrestrial. But, but that's the type of thing that you don't think of. That's what I point out. I point out the obvious. You see, you've heard phrases like worse is better. That's a good phrase. That's a, that's a steel term. I do like the more obvious, the better. I point out the obvious. We point out the turn of the punch bowl. We do it again and again. The more, do, the more you do it, the more it becomes effective in a, in a society that's become, de, that's become demoralized, but yet it's coming out. It's geared for right now. Remember, we're talking, uh, probably talking in 2009, late 2008. So it's right now. You worried about who got elected? Don't worry about that. Uh, to worry about what's in front of you, what you can control. Don't become idealistic. I'm not idealistic. You think politics is idealistic? It's not. What I do isn't idealistic at all. It's achieving objectives by any means necessary political, using the law against the law, using rules against the law, but not, rules against rules, but we don't break them. We don't have to.
Everything you want to do can be achieved under the law. Someone in Russia wanted to deport Georgians. When the Georgians uh, accidentally attacked, <laughs> attacked Russia, they ended up deporting every single Georgia. They screamed human rights violations, but they didn't get the call. Why? That's, well, it's international law. The Russians were abiding by the law, but they don't break it. They don't give anyone a target. They're very clean. And he deported millions of them at the blink of an eye. Very interesting scenario. But uh, and, and it's the full-spectrum practical politics need not involve warfare, but it can. It just doesn't involve breaking any laws. You see, you can go to war under the law, but you can only go into war under certain conditions, or you can get yourself in human rights, and so on and so forth, etc. I'm going to go into this. It's very dynamic. It's something you've seen played in front of you. Maybe it was played against you. You didn't know it. But I'm going to go into this more, and uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep this conversation alive. But I need to prep you on these topics before I give you uh, talking points, because that's kind of irrelevant for me to issue talking points, and because they're so simple, and for you not to understand how it works but you cannot escape sound you cannot escape sound sound is killing uh, sound can kill yes it can harmonics are everything no one on this planet escaped i i i think we can or i wish we can or oh yes we can i'm sorry i even i forgot uh another interesting point of consensus trance is something the brown world's in 90 percent of this planet's brown 90 uh, percent of this planet is afraid to attack obama yeah, white people are attacking Obama verbally, but everyone else is afraid to. Uh, he went to South America, and he's not their friend. They know he's not their friend, but they don't really know what to do with it. So they kind of walked around, shook his hand, whatnot. It's very weird. It's very funny. But you think this only applies to you. No, it applies to the whole planet. The whole planet's been brainwashed. Uh, media is very encompassing now. But it's very funny stuff. It's very dynamic. If, if you're in a trance, you can't see it. And if you're in a, a consensus type thinking, you're never going to see the type of things. But that's okay. That's what we're here for. And that's the end of the discussion on, on active measures, and I'm going to go into some other stuff, some antidotes, so on and so forth, but I just want you to have that down. The inevitable future, the inevitable future. Uh, many of you have seen their, uh, our enemy's statistics about the inevitable future. Well, that's a classic demoralization technique. The inevitable future will never happen. Fifty years from now, the population statistics will never happen. Uh, their, their stuff has never once been right in the history of their stuff, and that goes, they've used this technique for hundreds of years, actually. The inevitable future. Um, you know, the inevitable future, everyone has a Korean grandmother. The inevitable future of Mexico is this or Mexico is that. The inevitable future and the inevitable future. It's all a lie. Their statistics are always a lie because race is real and it matters. But, but their statistics are, are garbage. Their statistics are like the Soviet statistics when it was on its last legs. Uh, and they know that, too. The biggest thing they worry about is a place collapsing and you getting up leaving because they're not going to have any power. Uh, Europeans are spread out over the whole top of the planet. Yes, the whole top of the planet. We have all the land on this planet. We're sitting on all the key watering holes, and we have serious weapon systems. We don't have little weapons. And they know that. The inevitable future is, is again, is a typical demoralization technique. Um, the, you know, that's the only inevitable future you know, is that you're 10% of the population and you've got the whole top of the planet. And uh, any time you expand, you consolidate. So the only inevitable future would be in a collapse. You might go into consolidation and you'll end up in a Russian-German axis. Uh, you know, so-called Western civilization moves east. They're more worried about that than they are in uh, uh, 50 years from now, you being half Mexican. They ain't going to happen. They know that. Uh, so don't fall for any classic demoralization technique. It's all BS. It, it, it fear produces a consensus trance. You, you, we see this on some of the uh, boards we've analyzed, uh, several of the white nationalist boards. Don't get into a consensus trance. Don't fall for that. But it's difficult if you don't know what it is. They're difficult traps. I'm also going to go in and introduce you to traps that are dynamic called ethnic conflict models, uh, ECMs. Uh, they were invented a long time ago, and they've been developed over hundreds of years. Uh, communists perfected them. I'm going to introduce you to all kinds of neat stuff just so you know about it. They could come up. This stuff is dynamic. It's, it happens in front of you every day. But let's go back to uh, proactive and active measures. You see, true information will not mean anything to the Muslims. Uh, I could take out a Muslim and take him to a Holocaust museum, but they're never going to believe it. True information it will not work, even if it's true. They won't believe it. You see, I could take out uh, your average self-hating white animal, the baby boomer that, that hates himself for being white, but true information won't mean anything. It takes 15 years uh, to basically neutralize it. That's how toxic this stuff is. Uh, brainwashing is a big deal. 
that's how it works. But there are techniques to neutralize uh, the Lone Rangers. Uh, they're called humiliation techniques. Um, it's pointing out the obvious again and again. It seems, uh, it seems trivial, but it's not. It's kind of insidious. It's what they fear the most. You see, no closed society has ever in the history of the world been brought down through steel. The Timothy Vase can't bring down uh, the Berlin Wall. It doesn't work that way. Yugoslavia happens after the fact. It doesn't happen before. That happens much later. They know that. Uh, but sound does bring it down. It's always done through talking points through sound. It's the Horn of Jericho brings down the walls of Jericho, not bombs. The silver whistle brings down the bulletproof glass if it's designed correctly. But that's what Bob does, and that, that's what I'm here to help you with, uh, to put you on a cons consistent set of talking points. Now, talking points work simply because you're making a point. Uh, you're not arguing. You will never hear me argue. I don't argue. I just make a point over and over again. If you had the experience of seeing Bob on, on Fox News, some Fox affiliate had him briefly. They'll never have him again. The, we don't get invited to parties in Washington for a reason. They don't want to know he exists. I know what you're thinking. He worked for the CIA. That's dicey. I'll tell you things about his time as a CIA that I know, uh, or that I, I like his interview process, but the, the Bob was hired there because he's very good at what he does, and what goes on on the inside is not necessarily what you think. Don't think that they're not looking for people to become visible to help themselves. You don't know anything. You only think you do. We don't know anything about you. Most people don't know anything about each other in this society or on this planet. Most guys are not like Bob. Most guys are not. What you see is what you get. Most guys will not sit in a CIA interview and, and if asked if they're anti-Semitic, oh yes, I believe all Jews should get their own. Uh, I believe everyone deserves their own country, which, which is to say I believe all Jews should get their own countries. Someplace they can Judaize each other. But I also believe all Jews should go there. I don't like being Judaized. So yes, that makes me an anti-Semite. He said that at a CIA interview. And yeah, Jaws dropped. Jaws dropped. You say something like that, you're going to get attention and visibility. And uh, he got hired. He got hired. Sure. It, what goes on on the inside is not what you think. But yeah, it takes some bottom balls to say that. you got to be YC Wig to say that. Most people wouldn't. Most of you will not say that at, a, at, a, at, a, at an alphabet agency interview. But if you do, you could be useful to someone there. Or someone couldn't stop him from being hired. Oh, and he was sitting across from a Hebrew when he said it. There's nothing they could do. He's good at what he does. He's that good. He's that dangerous for you. They ignore him. Why don't they go after him? Well, going after someone like Bob could trigger something much larger. <laughs> you know, half of them don't know where the other half of the agencies are, and a third of the people that work for them, don't, they don't know do. So, so you end up in a dangerous and volatile situation. Uh, if they went after something like Bob, uh, you are, you use your imagination. You, you would probably know about it very quickly, so would the rest of the planet. <laughs> so so don't, don't think everything's going on, or don't think everyone's out to get you. Don't be in a consensus trance or a fear trance. Uh, Bob Whitaker is very dangerous, but he's not dangerous in a dealing steel capacity, although he could be under certain conditions, I guess. Uh, you know, anyone, anyone can learn to use a gun effectively. That's the first thing they teach you. But uh, he is dangerous uh, because, uh, because what he does is much more violent, actually. Much, what, much more violent to this type of system. They just try to ignore him. That's why you won't have him. Unless someone overrides and, you know, that, that can happen. You can get overrides. Uh, people running angles are in a lot of trouble right now. That doesn't mean deals can't be cut. It doesn't mean uh, Lando Carissa and, uh, you know, like that Star Wars uh, movie where someone's in a crisis and uh, Lando uh, Carlissian uh, gets a visit from Darth Vader and he's got to do a deal. Well, Darth Vader doesn't do nice deals, but that's okay. You know, the fact that he can do a deal is fine. Um, and, 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 and if someone's in a crisis, when I use that term, someone's in a crisis, uh, immediately, uh, and if we're doing deals with them, they're doing deals with Darth Vader. We're not, we're not Lando. We're Darth Vader. <laughs> and the deals wouldn't be nice, but that can happen. In that case, Lando has to give up Han Solo and everything else he wants <laughs> because Darth Vader doesn't, doesn't play nice. But, uh, but these are just uh, topics and techniques. When I use wide sky, what you don't see can kill you politically. These are our terms. Undercover lover, that's what you think of as a lone wolf. I don't use those terms. I don't deal steel. Uh, blowing big kisses. Blowing big kisses could be setting off a scenario. Uh, YC Wig. Bob is what you see is what you get. Uh, most people don't understand that. It scares them because they're not used to seeing it this society or on this planet. This whole planet's wide sky. No one, you don't know anything about your Democratic senator. You just think you do. The right day at the right hour comes up and he hits a talking point that I've said may blow your mind. You need to be prepared for that. But then again, as you're driving in your squad car, who on earth knows what you do? No one. 
No one. That's how this society works right now. That's how the planet is, basically. So you're 15, 15 years after uh, demoralization has been neutralized with the new medium. The new medium is dynamic, internet. This thing I'm talking on, something like this has never been done on the internet. Most something like me, you probably never heard the topics I'm talking about are quite in the same way. It's pretty interesting stuff to some people. Some people throw it out. I don't care. Uh, there are no PayPal links. Uh, you're white rabbits. Uh, we play follow the white rabbit. I'm not idealistic. You just think someone like me is. No, I'm about taking power. I show you how to take power verbally over a situation. That's where it all begins. Or playing Follow the White Rabbit, which is much more dynamic than you think. Follow the White Rabbit is a game you're already playing. I'm just going to teach you how to do it in the next level, and we're going to use Bob's stuff because Bob is good. Bob's so good that someone needs him, and we need him. Uh, But Bob's work is done. I'm not the velvet pen. I'm the velvet tongue. I'm the one that's walking you through. Uh, Stage one, understanding a talking point. Martha Stewart's a very famous lady. Martha Stewart uh, had some visitors uh, from I don't know what agency they were from or from the local office of uh, maybe it was a local uh, actually attorney attorney's office in New York. They visited her and asked her a bunch of questions. I can't even remember what it was over. Uh, Martha Stewart ran her mouth. Uh, Martha Stewart did not understand practical politics. Martha Stewart went to jail. She ran her mouth all the way to jail. Martha Stewart could have handed him uh, easily handed them a, a, a card to her lawyer. I'm sure she has several lawyers and several cards on her at all time. She could have handed uh, the whoever was asking her that, the prosecutor, she could have handed him a card to her attorney and say, I have nothing to say. She could have stayed on point. She could have said, I have nothing to say. Please call my attorney. You know, this happened a long time ago. I, I need to collect my records. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. That's an exercise in practical politics. Uh, Martha Stewart ran her mouth, and she ran it all the way to jail. We don't want to run our mouths. We want to make our point. You see, saying I have nothing to say and handing someone a card to your lawyer is making a point. We want to always make our point. If we open up our mouths, we want to have something intelligent to say. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So what's the first talking point I want to introduce you to? The first one is quite simple. Many of you are used to... uh, You've seen something dynamic happen maybe in the last 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, especially in the last 12, because we're right on time. Uh, Maybe you're one of these uh, old-timers walking around Texas who always say, I'm a racist and you've said it for 30 years. Now you're seeing people pay attention to you. They don't really care anymore or they're agreeing with you. Well, that's good. Uh, that you're seeing neutralization. Um, this is very dynamic stuff I'm teaching you. Uh, but one thing you want to always make a point of is interjecting yourself in the conversation. I'm going to show you a broader way to say that. That that's not illegal in any country. You see, saying I'm a racist in Britain can, in London can get goofy stuff can happen. But they can't do anything about what we're showing you how to do. You see, uh, weaving velvet is a little more dynamic. It cannot be stopped once it's started. It is more violent. Uh, than grenades against a structure because there's no protection against it. The first talking point uh, I'm going to give you is, in your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. Anti-racism is a code word for anti-white. In your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. Anti-racism is a code word for anti-white. In your opinion, I'm a racist. You're just saying that because I'm white. Anti-racism is a code word for anti-white. You see, what they've done is say all whites are racist for years, and uh, basically most of you have noticed this. What I'm doing is pointing it out indirectly that can never be illegal or anything else. This type of stuff gives them fits in a closed society. What I want you doing, though, is taking moral authority over a group. I don't deal in me's. I deal with we's, making sure I never get in the way of us. So all my stuff is dynamic. Every time me or Bob give you something, it can be uh, repeated by anyone anywhere. You see, in your opinion, he's a racist, you're just saying it because he's white. In your opinion, she's a racist, you're just saying it because he's white. In your opinion, that old man's a racist, you're just saying it because he's white. It, you can say it if you're brown, you can say it if you're black, it doesn't matter, it's dynamic. Very dynamic. Saying I am a racist is not necessarily dynamic, you're just talking about yourself. It's wonderful, it can work, it can give you moral authority, but what we do is very dynamic and can never be outlawed, period. And that's why it gives them fits. The second one is is kind of funny. Uh, Mexico for the Mexicans, Africa for the Africans, white countries for everybody. And you can change it around. 
Muslim countries for the Muslims, Asia for the Asians, white countries for everybody. You can keep changing it around. It's funny. It's dynamic. It's true. Uh, if I could, uh, if you could get 100,000 Muslims uh, trompsing around London and pass that around and have them shout that at Westminster, uh, you might even be able to get uh, BMP to swing an election or to push a, to push a behind-the-scenes negotiation really quickly. Uh, it's a humiliation technique. You see, a lot of this stuff is humiliating. A lot of people have been conned and they're angry. And uh, the first step toward a con is, is not admitting it. The second te- step is, is kind of like um, uh, despondence. Uh, you you kind of want to ignore that you've been conned, but you're admitting you've been conned. You know, it admits, and now you're admitting it. The third step is anger, and a lot of people are becoming angry, and what you're doing is giving them outlet. But you're also humiliating the major group going against us, the Lone Rangers, the self-hating white people. Uh, your enemy is basically all looks like you and has no loyalty to you. But that's what it does. It's a humiliation technique. And it is kind of humiliating for the liberals to, ha- to hear that screamed at them. Uh, it's funny. Uh, most of you guys want to argue that it's what you're geared for. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, talking points work. Making your point. And this is geared toward, again, a close society. A close society is society based on uh, the fact that it owns the truth. Uh, they know diversity doesn't work because as soon as they stop enforcing it, you're going to all move to part of the planet and they're not going to have any power. Now they got problems. they got problems, big problems. So what we want to do is start humiliating the Lone Rangers. And the people that look like us and are trying to speak for us, we want to start humiliating them. And this is a great technique. It's insidious. It's not illegal, but they fear it more than they fear anything, believe it or not. Uh, and that's kind of why they, they, <laughs> they will always ignore this stuff and ignore Bob until they can't. Uh, but it, it, is, it is one of the reasons, too, you've seen them have Clint Eastwood talk about diversity and stuff. They're panicking. They're panicking because they know what we're doing. This stuff is already in other countries. Yes, yes, we are global. I'm not idealistic, which means I'm not, a, I don't believe in any wordism. Nationalism is a form of wordism. I'm a white rabbit, you're a white rabbit. I don't see language as a barrier. We get around that. I got associates everywhere. Someone like me operates everywhere. And so should you. And that's wonderful. You belong to an organization where you automatically belong to mine. I'm not interested in your organization. I'm just interested in making sure you have effective equipment so when you open up your mouth, you make it an exercise in personal power at all times. If you want to maintain visibility or you want to get visible, well, you need to have the precise thing to say. That's just common sense. What I want you to say in regards to immigration is quite simple right now. No one is talking about flooding Mexico, or it's not a Mexican problem. No one's talking about flooding Mexico with non-Mexicans and giving them affirmative action, special rights and privileges, and free health care. It's not an African problem. No one's talking about flooding Africa with non-Africans and giving them affirmative action, special rights and privileges, and free health care. Oh, and it's not an Asian problem. No one's talking about flooding Asia with non-Asians and giving them affirmative action, special rights and privileges, and free health care. Only white countries are being flooded. Only white politicians are doing it, and only white children are being affected. It's genocide. You made your point. Listen to what I said again and make your point. No one's talking about flooding Mexico with non-Mexicans and giving them affirmative action, special rights, and privileges, and free health care. No one's talking about African. It's not an African problem. And giving them affirmative action, special rights, and privileges, and free health care. No one's talking about flooding Asia with non-Asian. And giving them affirmative action, special rights, and privileges, free health care. Only white countries are doing it. Only white children are being affected. Only white politicians are doing it. And uh, it's genocide. You can make it your own. You could certainly say, no, no one's talking about flooding Muslim countries. Use your imagination. Uh, what you're doing is making a point. You're not arguing. We're not here to argue. We're here to make our point uh, against a society that's coming out of a demoralized state quickly. Oh, also, uh, many of you have heard this used against children every day, and many of it, you know, growing up, is used all the time. Race is a social construct. Uh, there are no social constructs under international law. Uh, most of you think that the law, maybe you know now that the law is not very nice, but international law is some of the most ruthless laws you can deal with. The type of laws that the Russians, uh, the FSB looks at, and, and different human rights groups look at, um, uh, the type of laws we deal with are, are nothing to fool with. The type of laws that, that, that someone like us would uh, have at our exposure is that, Bob, that Bob has great contacts in and, and uh, that we're starting to look at are nothing in any way, shape, manner, or form to fool with. Uh, Saddam Hussein was not hung by in a wild, wild west type type of deal. Saddam Hussein was hung in a tribunal. He wasn't uh, shot in the head. He had velvet wrapped around his neck. And you need to understand that we have this at our disposal. Any time prior to 1948, you could do anything you wanted and called war. 
post-1948, it comes into full spectrum. Practical politics start it. Uh, in international law, you cannot target. When I say target, it means you cannot target a genotype, that's where you get the word genocide, an ethnic group or religion in any way, shape, manner, form, or harm or destruction. You're thinking right away I'm talking about mustard gas and Saddam Hussein fired mustard gas at the Kurds. Well, that's true. But it's much more dynamic than that. It's not static. This stuff is not static. I don't deal with static things. It is is any type of targeting whatsoever for harm or damage. If you're crazy enough to go on the record, someone's crazy enough to have you on the record, you're crazy enough to fund building the weapons. It doesn't matter if it's mustard gas or social engineering. If you're targeting under international law, you are owned. You cannot get in that lettuce patch. Lettuce patches are always illegal to rabbits. Stick to your peas and carrots. International law is ruthless. You see, there's no voting. There's no voting at a tribunal. There's no voting at an ICC, an international criminal. There's no voting. Uh, There are no voting by jurors. Uh, Your lawyer won't matter. (laughs) Forget your priest. Forget your lawyer. Forget your rabbi. Get a violinist. If something like me is at your door and you're going to tribunal, you're over with. You're done. You're done. The banks that financed it could be done. Everything. It's it's one big bowl of soup at once. It is it is uh, it is uh, ruthless. And you can assume uh, most of you are thinking someone's in trouble in Anglosphere. That's true. You see, there was a clear targeting. And from uh, mid-1960s to late 70s, we have uh, wild events happening. We have all these countries that are only and only white countries open up the floodgates without any voting taking place. There wasn't really any voting. Someone knocked down the doors, and they flooded these places. Um, And then they hit all the social engineering weapons. Well, someone had to finance that. There's a clear targeting. Only white children. It's a clear targeting. They're targeting a genotype. You can't do that under the law. You walked into a lettuce patch. It's very dangerous stuff. I'm going to fill you in on this stuff. But when, when, I, when, I have, when I give you a talking point like there are no social constructs under international law, you can use that. Use it over and over again. The more you use a talking point, the more dangerous it becomes. Uh, am I saying that someone's getting geared up to go after someone? Most of you saw all the complications with Russia, and you don't know what's going on. Well, the Russians have the foremost archives of any, uh, of any intelligence agency post-48, and there's other groups, too. They got, they got rooms full of this stuff. You can't go on the record and target little white rabbits. It just doesn't work like that on international law. Most people don't understand that. Your enemy does. It's, it's ruthless stuff. You can weave velvet ropes uh, for days on end, and it's the law. And there's no voting. There's no voting. It's not a vote. You don't get a vote. You don't need a lawyer. You forget your lawyer. Get a priest uh, or get a violinist. Uh, The gavel's going to sing, and it's going to sing, swing, rabbit, swing. Saddam Hussein uh, can't say uh, uh, the Kurds were a social construct. It doesn't work that way under international law. Timothy Weiss always goes on record. All these anti-racists go on record because they've been brainwashed by all these social engineering schools. And some of them just have it in for little white rabbits. But they've been brainwashed. Uh, Jane Elliott is a walking human rights violation under the right conditions. But that's what there's a lot of fear over. You cannot target. You cannot go there under international law. There's been a clear targeting. And heaven forbid someone have the goods, the whole, the, the whole Shabazz on who financed it and what the, and they, they were actually targeting. Like someone says, you know, we got to get rid of them uh, to have our particular uh, plan go forward or we got to blend them out of it. You can't go there. It doesn't matter that it's not mustard gas. It doesn't matter. Any attempt to harm, any attempt to target, any attempt to harm, if you're crazy enough to say it. You see, Saddam Hussein even, he didn't say it. He just did it, and it was a war, but it didn't matter. International law is that ruthless. Maybe you've been in the military, and you've seen all these guys uh, in the upper military all of a sudden get afraid, uh, afraid over tribunals or ICC-type courts. They scratch their heads. They start getting nervous. There's something to be nervous about. You can get targeted. Uh, if you're called into that, it doesn't matter what you are, someone's going to line you up, and there's not going to be any voting. <laughs> you see, that's practical politics is all non-voting. Full-spectrum practical politics may involve voting, but generally not. But that's something you need to be aware of. Uh, fear is useful, and, and there's a lot of fear in this stuff. And they're, they're aware of something for a reason. Something's going on. And uh, we need you on particular talking points for a reason. Uh, so if we open up our mouth, let's open up our mouth and make an exercise in power, or don't open up your mouth at all. 
There's nothing wrong with that. If you're some undercover lover sitting out there and you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Uh, if you want to, but of course, this is dynamic. If you want to, uh, you're in a, you're in an area after demoralization starts coming off, after it's been normalized for 15 years, you might be able to use these run for office and anything can happen. If you get visible, someone can throw you in. Uh, that is follow the white rabbit. That is how things operate. Uh, you may see uh, some uh, situation ensue, and you hear follow the white rabbit over over your um, uh, wideband radio uh, from your police station. You see uh, cops following the white rabbit. Next thing you know, uh, you end up uh, hitting a talking point. Use your imagination. That is full spectrum practical politics. Yes, you end up uh, running the whole police station or something during something. Uh, use your imagination. But follow the white rabbit is is where where everything begins. Uh, hitting a talking point, staying on point. Are there organizations that are going to do this? Um, and you're going to hear it? yes, you're going to hear this all across the place. You're going to hear variations of it. Pay attention to it. Even if you're not saying anything, pay attention to it. Open your ears up to a different game. And we can play this at a level that is. Uh, you can play it at a level any any level you want it, or not. I don't really care. I'm just putting it out there for you. I know that most of you won't do anything. I know that. The masses are asses. It only takes a couple. Uh, one person uh, stopped them from force integrating private schools. Bob Whitaker. Uh, three people did force busing across America. One person fought it. One person developed te- wide sky techniques to, to uh, enforce busing in certain areas. That was Bob. Um, in other words, uh, there was a lot of places that, 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 that used tactics that Bob developed. Uh, they didn't say it. They just did it. And they, they made sure people didn't get busted in their area. That happens too. That happened. By the way, the Mexicans did some of that in California. They didn't say it. They just did it. Because if they, if they said it and they voted on it, it would go to court. You know what to say. You know, they didn't just say it. They just did it. Uh, but that happens all the time in politics as well on a local level. But you need to have this at your disposal, and, and we're going we're gonna, to, uh, again, uh, continue this conversation. Uh, follow the White Rabbit is a game that teaches you practical politics. Practical politics, practical politics, because it's non-voting. Uh, voting politics falls into conventional politics. Uh, but practical politics is necessary for you to understand conventional politics or full-spectrum practical politics, which can involve uh, engaging and taking down a system and enemy by any means possible within the rules, but never breaking the rules. We don't have to break any laws here. It's just a matter of getting on point, staying on message. If you are have an organization and you want to repeat the talking points, that's wonderful. You want to uh, just, uh, it, there are no rules to what we do. You only think there are rules. There are no rules to geography for me. Me a white rabbit, you a white rabbit. We don't have rules. You're going to hear associates do this and you may hear uh, Italian politicians hit in Italy. Who knows what you'll hear. Pay attention. You may hear across, uh, again, uh, you could hear things trigger. Uh, a trigger is, uh, is when you're going to hear a talking point and you'll know what to do. Why, you're smart. You're smart. If you, if you get, make yourself visible at the right time, if you want to become visible, you do it by hitting a consistent message for people. Um, that's the way that works. I know what you're saying, that you're worried about uh, becoming visible and getting picked up. Many of you are too full of fear. Uh, half the alphabet agencies don't know where the other half are at. But if you're fearful, don't worry about it. Just sit back and relax. Play a different game. Um, but in a certain situation, it'll become rather obvious. There's nothing for you to be afraid of. So, uh, but if you're opening up your mouth already, you might as well have the best talking points money can buy, and that's what we do. I'll give you one for the economy, uh, one to go. China is 91% Chinese. If China tried to make itself non-Chinese, don't you think China would collapse? America in 1965 was roughly 89% Indo-European. America tried to make itself non-European. America has collapsed. America's manufacturing system has collapsed. Why do you think that is? You made your point. If you're on camera, you make your point, well, you're going to get big cookies. You're going to get big, forget the cookies, you're going to get the big carrots. We want you to have the best talking points money can buy, and we have that. You have that at your disposal as of right now. Uh, Use it. If you have a radio radio show or if you just use these talking points, uh, you never know. You may see your donor list bump up or something. That's already happening. Uh, you will never meet me, so there are no guarantees. There are no guarantees to, to this to how this works, but you're already a white rabbit. Me a white rabbit, you a white rabbit. You're wearing your fur rabbit. But uh, you can get carrots. Uh, you can get visibility. Uh, if you want to be visible, we have to know who you are, what you are, when the time comes. Use your head. Uh, yeah, white rabbits are going to have big brains, or you're not going to be able to play this game. It's that simple. I don't worry about stupid white rabbits. They don't survive. You can also get promoted. Yes, you can get promoted. You see, there's no voting in a promotion. Yes, if you see Follow the White Rabbit being played at work, you can get promoted. Sure, it happens all the time. There's no voting 
and follow the white rabbit. <laughs> it, it may involve voting, but there's no voting. There's no voting at your job when you get promoted, generally. Uh, there's certainly no voting when you get, when you get promoted playing follow the white rabbit. That's how this stuff works. These are these are velvet techniques, but I'm just introducing you stuff. I'm I'm, I'm just introducing you this stuff. I'm I'm the voice, and we'll continue this conversation again. Follow the White Rabbit is a game to teach you practical politics. When we open up our mouths, we make an exercise in practical politics, an exercise in power, not an exercise in stupidity.